So good afternoon. Today we're going to give an update on the Commonwealth's contact tracing program, but first I want to share a quick update on testing and hospitalization. Yesterday we reported 6,300 new tests. That brings the total number of tests conducted in the Commonwealth to almost 340,000, which makes us the top five player on a per capita basis among the larger states here in the U.S. The positive test rate for this particular batch of tests was 28 percent. Now, over the past several days, this number has been trending down closer to 10 to 20 percent, so we're obviously going to take a close look at that data. But even with yesterday's data, less than 16 percent of tests over the past week have been positive, which is lower than at any point in April. And as we said before, our test results in many cases are an indication of where we test and who we test. Um, and we do need to remember that that has a lot to do in some cases with the results. That's why we continue to expand testing, because we believe at the end of the day, the more we test, the more we know. And that's especially true when you test in places where you're particularly concerned about the populations uh, that are involved, which is why we test in hotspots, why we set up a big program with community health centers across the Commonwealth, why we've been testing in healthcare facilities and uh, long-term care facilities. And we continue, as I think everybody knows, to have daily conversations with the healthcare community to carefully monitor hospitalization rates and healthcare capacity. There are currently 3,564 patients that are hospitalized in Massachusetts due to COVID-19. This represents a small increase from the numbers reported on Tuesday, and it continues to be about 5% of the total cases here in Mass that are hospitalized. We're making progress here, but I want to remind everyone that we're still very much in the fight. Another way we're continuing to push back against the virus is to pursue additional personal protective equipment, or PPE, as of yesterday, we've distributed over 9 million pieces of PPE to hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers, cities and towns, and first responders in all corners of the Commonwealth. This includes gloves, gowns, masks, and ventilators. We know that people are obviously anxious to return to some sort of daily routine that made up the way we all live before COVID-19 and the outbreak associated with that. And we're constantly talking to our healthcare leaders from across Massachusetts to monitor all of this data. The first step associated with reopening, where a limited number of businesses and activities can resume under new conditions, can't begin unless we see sustained downward trends in many of these healthcare indices. As you all know, the health data we're watching includes positive tests, hospitalization rates, ICU capacity, and of course, fatalities. Yesterday's numbers are evidence that despite some signs of trending in the right direction, we still have a lot of work to do uh, when it comes to getting to the point where we feel like we have our hands and our arms around this virus. As we see the curve flatten, we can begin thinking about permitting some businesses to resume operations. And we want to reinforce that by increasing the importance of testing and contact tracing. We've talked a lot about testing. We've talked a little bit about tracing. And we thought it would be important today to talk specifically about how contact tracing works, what we've been up to, what our results are so far, and how we see the future with respect to this. And as we think about reopening the Commonwealth, there are many things we still need to do as part of our daily routines, like wearing a face covering in public when you can't maintain social distancing, washing your hands, and appreciating the hygiene issues associated with disinfecting surfaces frequently. And of course, we have and continue to increase our testing capacity, and we actively support someone when they test positive so that they can isolate and recover. But to bring the fight fully to the virus and get ahead of it, we also need to identify confirmed cases and the people they might have been exposed to, their so-called close contacts. And that's where contact tracing comes in. Contact tracing is a common public health tool that's used for diseases like measles, tuberculosis, Ebola, Zika, and now COVID. And it's usually done by local boards of health or by our State Department of Public Health or by nonprofit organizations in collaborations with governments, especially in developing countries. And for such a contagious disease like COVID-19, tracing is a critical part of how we take the battle to the virus. 
Last ma month, we set up the Massachusetts Community Tracing Collaborative. This group is a collaboration with local boards of health, the Department of Public Health, and Partners in Health, which is a nonprofit located here in Massachusetts to contain the spread of the disease. We were the first state in the nation to launch a statewide program in contact tracing, and we're fortunate to have the expertise of Partners in Health on board as we launch. The doctors supporting us have worked on fighting diseases like Ebola, and they've proven their model can work in places with far more ch challenging circumstances than we see here. We believe this tracing program will be a key element toward not only stopping the spread of COVID-19, but also toward understanding where the virus is, who it's infected, and where if we, if we need to, to invest in hotspotting. If you test positive for COVID-19, you'll be contacted by the Community Tracing Collaborative or your local Board of Health. On that call, we want to be sure that you have what you need to isolate yourself while you recover. That might mean food if you haven't been to the store in a while or other needs. We'll also ask you who you've been in close contact with for the previous couple of days before you started to have symptoms, or a couple of days before your positive test if you didn't have any symptoms. Then we need those people to pick up the phone. We want them to know why they should stay home, and we want to make sure they also have what they need to isolate and quarantine effectively. If you get a call or a text from your local Board of Health or from the MA COVID team, it's vital that you take that call. Doing so means you're helping your family, your friends, and your community, and the rest of us, by reducing the spread of the virus. This call is your chance to fight back against COVID-19. So far, tens of thousands of Massachusetts residents have participated in contact tracing. To date, the Community Tracing Collaborative is connected with nearly 14,000 confirmed cases and reached out to more than 7,500 of their contacts since calls first started on April 12th. The Mass COVID team includes more than 1,600 people making calls. While more staff is anticipated, the team's working at nearly full speed, a remarkable accomplishment in barely a month since we announced this initiative. The median number of contacts reported by each confirmed case remains at about two. This is a good sign that people are taking social distancing seriously, but that doesn't mean that folks can let up on the social distancing now. You'll soon hear from two people who will share their on-the-ground experience with our community tracing program, Damone Chaplin, Public Health Director for the City of New Bedford, and John Welch from Partners in Health. They're already doing tremendous work, but for this effort to be successful and grow quickly, we need residents to answer the phone and to talk to our contact tracers when they call. Please, if you're contacted by the collaborative, Please take the call and provide the relevant information to the caller. Phone calls will be from an 833 or an 857 number, and your phone will say the call is from MA COVID team. This is very important. If you see MA COVID team, please pick up the phone. We'll continue to do all we can at the state level to push back against this insidious disease, but this is your chance to be part of the fight against the virus and to help us all get back to a new normal and contain the disease. We're counting on all of you at home to do your part here and to answer that call. Now I want to turn it over to New, England, New Bedford Public Health Director, Damone Chaplin, to share more about what his experience with the contact tracing program has been like at the local level. Thank you, Governor. So I want to share a little bit, uh, I'll, I'll go further a little bit on what contact tracing is um, and how it, how it will help uh, your family and your community. In short, uh, contact tracing is a simple public health tool used to protect you uh, and your family from COVID. Uh, it's about separating sick people from the healthy people to keep more people healthy. Uh, it's a phone call. It's a conversation. It's about getting help for you and your family. It's a coordinated effort between patient or suspect patient, state health department, your local health department, and health care providers. This process uh, it includes an initial phone call, which begins the case investigation process, 
a follow-up phone call which allows their health department and or the CTC um, to perform their contact tracing. Uh, and then it's a series of suggestions, recommendations for you and your family. In New Bedford, the contact tracing coordination between the New Bedford Health Department and the CTC program will significantly enhance the department's ability to plan for the future and respond to COVID-19 related activities. The CTC program is coming at a time when many local health departments are struggling to keep pace with the demands of their local surge and are in need of a temporary reprieve. For many families, help is but a phone call away and may be the only thing separating you and your loved ones from a fully restored life. So I ask you today to answer the phone, have the conversation, and get the help. After all, someone else may be depending on your important input. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters, Commissioner Burrell. Um, it's my pleasure to represent the Community Tracing Collaborative on behalf of Partners in Health. Um, and I just want to share with you what you might expect if uh, you get a call from the Community Tra Tracing Collaborative. I'll start by saying that um, contact tracing has been going on for a long time before the Community Tracing Collaborative started and will continue for a long time after uh, our our program is no longer needed. Uh, those activities were carried out by the local boards of health in Massachusetts and around the United States. And uh, we're really here to serve uh, as a support and as a backstop um, for those boards of health who are um, seeing a lot of cases and have also all of their essential daily activities that they need to maintain uh, while COVID's still going on. So to that end, if you get a call from the Community Tracing Collaborative, we are a representative of um, the uh, command center, uh, the COVID command center, as well as um, the Department of Public Health. Um, the individuals reaching out to you are people who live here in Massachusetts. They are your um, neighbors and they are uh, community members who are interested in keeping you well. And to that end, they're also interested in maintaining your privacy and security. So all the information that you share with us is strictly for public health activities and will not be shared outside of that realm. Um, the folks reaching out to you will uh, may be sharing with you for the first time that your test result is positive, uh, that you, in fact, do have COVID. That's a difficult conversation, and uh, we believe that we've employed uh, the best folks in Massachusetts to share that information with you and provide you the information that you need to stay safe and keep your family safe. Um, after we establish how you're doing and uh, whether or not you have what you need to stay safely isolated and then connect you with those isolation and, and social services, we'll ask you for information about who you've been in contact with. At the moment, close contact is considered anybody that you've been around um, within six feet for 15 minutes or more. That's considered close contact. Um, it's helpful for all of us to think about right now who those people are, so that if ever you do receive a phone call, you're able to share that information with us. And then we'll reach out to those contacts without sharing any private information about uh, who the, the case is, um, to share information with the contacts about what it means to quarantine whether or not you have what you need to safely quarantine, and also what you should do in order to get a test. Um, we also have a cadre of people who are charged with the task of connecting you to resources that already exist in your communities to make sure that you can stay, stay, stay safe, keep your family safe, and um, that we can uh, stop the, the, the transmission of COVID. And, uh, at, the, at the end of all of this, contract tracing is actually an effort to care. Um, we are uh, in a new, a new place in healthcare in the United States, which means we are reaching out to you uh, to try to provide this caring activity uh, to keep you and your family safe and end transmission. Uh, thanks so much, and I'll hand it over to Commissioner Burrell. Good afternoon. 
It's good to be here with you today, and I appreciate our colleagues in public health joining us here today. In modern medicine, we're not used to this kind of treatment for disease that we're talking about today. These days, we have arteries unclogged with high-tech catheters. We have sophisticated robotic surgeries to amazingly hasten our recovery from surgery. The gifts of modern medicine are countless. But COVID is a new infectious disease without treatment at this time. And we need all of our public health tools now more than ever. As we wait for science to develop a vaccine, contact tracing and the investigation of cases is how we interrupt chains of infection and control this epidemic. Case investigation and contact tracing will continue to be some of our most powerful public health tools. Before our state of emergency that resulted in most of us staying at home and keeping a safe distance, our epidemiologists were identifying an average of 10 close contacts with every case, every person who had COVID-19. That meant that 10 people had spent at least 15 minutes within six feet of someone with COVID-19 during their infectious period, which can start as soon as two days before symptoms begin. Because of the sacrifices that our residents have made to protect one another during the pandemic, including staying at home, wearing face coverings, and keeping a safe difference, distance, the average number of close contacts per case has dropped to two. What does that tell us? It tells us that what we are all doing collectively to keep our state safe from this virus is working. There are many pieces of evidence for that, but one of the most important is these contact tracing numbers. All of our big and small sacrifices are working. Yes, it's hard for all of us, my family and yours, but staying home has absolutely made a difference. And this is because, and we know this because of the reduction in the number of contacts that we are now having to trace. And we need to realize that as we look to relaxing some of the business closures, it's possible that our number of contacts may climb back up again. That means our community tracing collaborative will continue to be important to supplement the work of our state and local public health leaders, as you've heard today, to ensure that everybody gets that personal outreach. As we open back up, this initiative will be critical. We will all need to continue to be patient. It's hard, I know. But we will continue to get through this together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and our colleagues in public health. As you heard from the Governor, Damon, and John, and the Commissioner, Contact tracing is that human-to-human -human connection that includes virtual check-ins with individuals who are COVID positive, asking them how they are, what they need, and also asking them for who they have had close contact with. As of May 5th, as the governor said, the Community Tracing Collaborative and our local boards of health have reached out to just under 14,000 individuals. Part of the collaborative includes team members that are care resource coordinators. Not surprising, a number of them are social workers. These are the individuals who follow up if there's a need to connect that individual with basic necessities such as food or medical care to help them and their families during isolation. 150 local boards of health, like our good friends in New Bedford, are conducting the tracing. They're making the hundreds of calls every day, but as you heard, so many are overwhelmed from their daily responsibilities in dealing with the surge, which is the importance of the Community Tracing Collaborative. The contact occurs through phone calls, texts, follow-up connections to needed service. It's, being in isolation is isolating, so that is why we felt it was so important to have that human-to-human -human connection. And as you heard, we have seen the positive effects of social distancing in Massachusetts. Contact tracing, like social distancing, works best if all of us are on board and participate. 
As part of the collaborative, we have launched a communications and visibility campaign that includes multilingual messages that are being used statewide with additional targeted activities in some of our communities. The goal is to make sure Massachusetts residents are aware of the importance of contact tracing and are ready to answer the call when the CTC or local Board of Health calls. Answer the call, stop the virus is the dominant call to action. The languages include messages in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Haitian Creole, and Vietnamese. The materials include flyers, one-page information sheets, sample texts, and email messages, websites and social media images, and digital video materials. And now I'd like to show you a sample, a sample ad. Am I good? <laughs> you can tell I'm not the technology guru. The collaborative has been holding, as I said, virtual town halls with another scheduled for day in, today in Brockton. The town halls are aired on local radio stations and languages important to the communities. They're held in Portuguese, Spanish, Haitian, and Cape Verdean Creole. More than 5,500 individuals have participated in these town halls on social media platforms, plus more listening on the radio. The town halls give residents the opportunity to ask important questions and get answers in their preferred language. And we're, with participation and support from mayors like Dan Rivera in Lawrence, Robert Sullivan in Brockton, listeners are getting information from trusted local sources. So please pick up the phone. If you see a call or a text from MA COVID team and area codes 833 or 857, please pick up. You can help reduce the spread and save lives by doing so. Thank you. Governor? Questions on this stuff? Governor, what's the rate that people are picking up the phone? Is, is that part well, successful? We should have one of you guys answer that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, there's a, a few different ways we look at uh, how, how people are picking up their phones, but um, those high touch conversations over a couple of minutes uh, is still relatively low, um, definitely less than 50%. And that's why we're um, doing this today and continuing the message um, of if you see a, a mass COVID team, 833 or 857 to, to pick up the call. Um, and we understand that there are some communities that may uh, be a little bit resistant to answering a phone call like this. Uh, we're leaving messages with those folks, sending text messages. They can call us back and they can be in touch with us. Um, but really, the act of picking up the phone is, is an act of caring for your community. Um, so the first outreach is by phone or text, um, and then if uh, we're having trouble reaching folks, that's when we um, are in close touch with our local Board of Health um, colleagues, and they're doing their, their usual activities, which is to go knock on doors, to uh, provide flyers or letters. Um, so it's a, it's a group effort to make that outreach. How do, you get the, how do you get the point across that people may feel like, hey, if I get this call and I talk to the people, that I'm going to get grounded, more or less? I mean, that, that mindset where I'm not sick, but I know I wasn't the other person who was sick. How do you get rid of that, that mindset? Because we're all going to be like, I'm not going to tell them because I want to go do my stuff. Uh, I think it's through efforts like this. Um, you know, my experience in this work was in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic, and it took a bit of time for the social mobilization and the social messaging for people to understand that uh, one of the most important things that they can do is to heed this advice around quarantine and isolation. Uh, it takes this effort, uh, it takes great leadership that we have here in Massachusetts, um, and uh, continually driving home the message that, uh, that, that staying home is one of the 
uh, the best things you can do. And the second best thing you can do is pick up the phone when we call. How can you guard against scams? Because I know people can fake the caller ID. You mentioned the area codes. And despite this great news conference, I think a lot of people are probably not going to remember the area codes. Um, so are you concerned about scammers? I might leave that to someone else. <laughs> we, there's, of course there's a concern about scam. Always there is. We're in a time in the United States where there's tons of spam phone calls. We've worked really hard with downstream telecom companies to make sure that our, uh, our caller ID makes it out to, to every, um, every individual with a, a cell phone or a landline. Um, and I think uh, one of the things we can do is have folks, if they're worried about a scam, have folks go ahead and call us back. Um, and they know that by calling that phone number, they'll be in touch with us. Um, and if there's ever a uh, report of a scam, they should report that uh, as they would anything else, because we'd like to know and, and, and try to get around that. Doctor, what, what geographic areas are you focusing on at this point? Is it statewide? Are there certain pockets in the state? Yep. Um, so uh, we're focused on all of Massachusetts. Um, we are in um, partnership with the local boards of health, who those of us, those of them in particular who need uh, additional assistance can electronically send us uh, that information about the cases they need us to work on. Uh, but we are deployed across the entire, uh, the entire state. Specific parts of the state that are more um, I think just looking at the, the, the uh, case transmission by municipality, you could see where we're, where we're busiest. Um, but we're, again, we're available for the whole state. What personal what information do you, should you expect to be Um, at the moment, it's enough, and uh, we have uh, definite opportunity to expand that if we needed to. Um, and we are seeing definitely that, um, as was mentioned before, the number of contacts being lower, we're able to really stay on top of these phone calls. Um, but as we start to think about um, what it looks like um, with, with uh, the potential for more contacts per case, uh, we definitely would think about... Um, altering our, our workforce. Should you have to give your per, uh, personal information, like your friends' phone numbers and stuff, should that be something you're expected to give out? Yeah, the only information we'll, we'll ask for is a name and a phone number. Um, no one who calls you should ever ask for a social security number. They should never ask for any sort of health inf insurance information, anything like that. Uh, this information is um, name and contact information only. That's a great question, and I think it just goes to um, show the great work that all of our local boards of health were doing to keep up with, with all of those other cases before uh, the Contact Tracing Collaborative uh, began. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the, some of the problems you've had setting up this organization? I've heard some technical issues and people leaving because of the stress of making these calls and dealing with people in this situation. I think we're all in sort of a new day and age, um, COVID is stressful. Um, COVID is stressful on our families, uh, in our day-to-day -day work, and um, certainly there are lots of people out there who want to help. And then um, the, the combination of speaking day in and day out to COVID patients plus the, the technical side of things um, has proved challenging for some people. And uh, I think that that's to be expected. I'll say, though, that we've had over 40,000 applicants to do this work. And that just says to me how many people in Massachusetts want to help and want to be a part of, of the solution. Um, and I think with any new endeavor, there's always uh, speed bumps that we, uh, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the team who uh, is working long hours uh, in, uh, through the night to make sure any of those uh, technical uh, speed bumps are smoothed out. Can you be any more specific about how many people have left and what the speed bumps were? Uh, don't have any specifics on how many people have left. It's not been, um, we've actually been surprised by the, the low attrition rate, um, which is, is nice. It, it speaks to the fact that people really want to uh, want to help out. And um, in terms of uh, technical speed bumps, just uh, some of the uh, database um, 
I am not a, a technical person, so uh, just some of the, the um, data uh, movement in the, in the database, all of that stuff has been very secure with good, uh, we just want to always assure data integrity. Thanks. So, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an observer of this, not a, I'm a huge supporter of it, but I would say three things. The first is I do think over time a lot more of the connection that's going to happen on the first call is going to take place between on the call back. I do think that's going to end up becoming one of the major ways you folks end up talking to people. The second thing I would say is that um, there are folks who reach out to their close contacts and tell their close contacts to expect to hear from the MA COVID team, which helps a lot with respect to getting the close contact to answer the phone. Um, <clears throat> on the issue about, you know, being grounded, you know, I can't say this enough. Um, people need to remember that this virus, for many people, is asymptomatic. They're not going to show symptoms, but that doesn't mean they're not a carrier, and it doesn't mean they can't infect other people. They can, and that in many ways for me is the most insidious part of all this. This virus makes some people deathly ill. It actually kills other people, and then there's a bunch of people for whom it has virtually no apparent outward sign at all. That's what makes it in many respects so dangerous. And I can just tell you, and I would say this to anybody in the audience, if I got a phone call from a friend of mine or a text from a friend of mine that said you were my last close contact or one of my last close contacts, I've tested positive, I want you to take this call from the mass COVID team when they reach out to you to talk about who you may have been in contact with, I'm going to take that call because I'm going to be worried about the possibility that I won't show symptoms and that I might be one of those people who would give this to people I care about. And we're going to do what we can to make sure that we can support people in isolation. That's a, you know, the secretary and her team in the command center have spent a lot of time with the folks at DPH and the folks at Partners in Health figuring out how we can help people isolate if they need to someplace other than where they live. Because for some folks, that's going to be a challenge. Um, but I think over time, um, this is going to be a major piece of our initiative to slow the spread, especially if we start thinking about people moving around in ways that they haven't been uh, for the past couple of months. And, and I, I go no further than what's happened in South Korea and in Seoul, okay? Um, in the month of May, they basically haven't had any new cases. Now, when you talk to anybody about what the key to their success has been, it's testing, tracing, and isolation. And a commitment, a joint commitment, on the part of the people of that city and that country to stand up against this virus by collaborating with one another, identifying when people are tested positive, and to do something about it. And I can't, I can't say how important that part of this exercise is going to be to making it possible for us to not just get to a new normal, but sustain it on a go-forward basis. And given the large percentage of the population that can get this and not know they have it and be carriers and spread it around, um, this whole issue about identifying contacts and making those connections and then supporting people in isolation is a huge part of how you actually contain this thing going forward. And, um, and it's a huge chance for people to do something positive. Um, I get the fact that it comes with um, a consequence, and that consequence is associated with isolation and, and, and quarantine. But, but the flip side of that is um, the way I would frame this to people, is it worth it to work with us to find 14 days to isolate yourself if you get one of these calls? to not put some family member or some friend or some neighbor in a terrible spot with respect to their own health status. I mean, for me, this really isn't a close call, and I would hope for most people in Massachusetts, and based on everything I know about the people in Massachusetts, that would be the call they would make, too. Governor, there seem to be two things going on here. One is efforts to try to contain this and trace it. <clears throat> 
the virus itself. Also, you have efforts to get business going on again. You'll be hearing back from them in a week or a week. Are those two things going to collide, or, or are they in concert with each other? I think they're complementary. I mean, one of the reasons we set this program up, and um, and honestly, you know, I'm, I'm aware of some of the technical issues. Now, I've worked in a lot of companies that have a lot of platforms in them, that spend a lot of time trying to communicate to outside parties, to each other, big gobs of information that you have to figure out how to sort and organize and protect and ID identify and all the rest. Um, the, fact that, the fact that people set this thing up in basically less than 30 days and created a platform, a customer relations platform, contact tracing platform, whatever you want to call it, that can scale to enormous size and feed data into the state's public health system at Maven so that they can then use that to support local boards of health and all the information gathering that's associated with what people do at the local level um, with a few bumps along the way. I think is pretty great. Now we could have said to them, you know, take your time. Don't go fast. We didn't. We said, we need you to get this up. And we need to have it up so that we can create some momentum around this so that if when the data actually says it's okay for us to start thinking about how we might phase in some return to a new normal, people would already be running. And a lot of the kinks that, associate, that were associated with starting up anything or standing up anything of this size and complexity would have been worked through. So I, I view them as completely complementary. I said from the very beginning, I think I said this the first time you and I talked about this, that I could not imagine how we could possibly get back to something that looked like a new normal without doing something like this. And it's proven to work in a number of other countries. Governor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but on the subject of businesses, um, <clears throat> you know, we've all noticed that golf courses are allowed to reopen with certain restrictions now. I was wondering what changed, what was it about the presentation, the pitches of the advisory board, the appeals to you and your administration that, um, you know, made you guys make this decision? Well, I think um, several weeks, I can't remember, I can't remember times, but at some point in the recent past, uh, we made a decision to join with the other sort of northeast states on a coalition to talk about the issues associated with reopening. And, um, and for some reason that was viewed by some people through a political lens. I didn't view it that way. I know the lieutenant governor didn't. We basically saw it as a way for us to make sure that we were communicating with and collaborating with um, the states that were contiguous to us or in our general vicinity so that we wouldn't do things that were terribly out of line of what they were doing and they wouldn't do things that were terribly out of line, or at least if they were going to, we would know about it, okay? <clears throat> if you take a look at what the states around us have been doing with respect to a number of things, um, that gets factored into the way the, the advisory board is working on guidance. It gets factored into the way the DPH folks think about this. It gets factored into industry-specific decision-making. Um, and in this particular case, with regard to golf, we basically took a model that was being used in several of the states that were around us that we felt was consistent with what our concerns were about it in the first place and applied it. Governor, um, there were a couple of golf courses, though, that did threaten to defy your order, which you suggested they don't. But my question really isn't about golf courses. I want to look ahead to places like restaurants or hair salons. What about them? What is your message to them? They want to turn the lights on before the middle of May. So um, that's another good reason for why we're working with other states and through this advisory board to make sure that the things we do can be done, first of all, can be done and done safely, and that secondly, there's some mechanism in place to monitor how people are performing. And, um, and I think you're likely to see, and I've said this before, that what's going to happen in Massachusetts is probably going to look reasonably over time like what happens in a bunch of these other places. Because we get the fact that it's going to be hard to do these things in a vacuum. You've got to be willing to think about how it's being done and how it's being organized um, in the states that are around you. So what I would say is that 
those places and those organizations are probably going to end up having the same kinds of conversations with us that they end up having with other states. And the, in the end, I think you're going to see a fair amount of uniformity between and among the states in the Northeast around how they handle these things. They may not all happen at the same time, because as we've also talked about before, we're in different places with respect to uh, where we are in the virus generally, which means the decisions that get made along a time frame are probably going to vary. But I do think, for the most part, people are going to pursue relatively similar approaches to this. Governor, uh, given that you were the last governor to approve golf, would you say you're being more cautious than maybe some of the other chief executives, or is there something you just, the optics are not good, or something you just didn't like about it? <laughs> so, we have not had the sort of positive trend development with regard to the key measures that everybody talks about that have been present in most other states. Now, there are some states who have measures that are actually going like this, but their overall penetration is so much lower than ours that you really can't think about it the same way, um, which I also said, that part of this is about making decisions that make the most sense for Massachusetts based on the facts on the ground in Massachusetts, okay? We also want to make sure that as we make decisions, we're not doing stuff that's wildly out of line with what's going on in other states if we believe it can be done safely. Well, you guys got a pretty decent presentation from them, right? Yeah. This level is the level that we believe is the safest and most appropriate level for them to be at at this point in time. People can choose to pursue it if they like to or not. But it's exactly the same policy and the same structure that's in place in several other states that are nearby, including New York. Governor, are you in talks with other states regarding uh, the resumption of elective medical procedures? Uh, you, you urge people to make, yeah, they can go to the hospital now if they're having ailments, but when should we be seeing that? And, and again, coordinating with the other states, because I understand doctors on the border are afraid that business is going to go elsewhere. <laughs> so, data, data, data is going to drive most of the decisions around when these things happen. I do believe that in the end, what happens here will look a lot like what happens in other places. But the timing associated with this stuff is going to be driven by where we are in Massachusetts relative to the same data points that we've talked about before that people are measuring and monitoring in other places. But I think the, the end result, I would hope and anticipate, would look fairly consistent across the states. Have you heard from the federal courts on the gun shops? And supposedly there's a judge out there that's going to rule that Massachusetts is violating the Second Amendment by keeping gun shops closed. Um, are you working on that issue? I haven't. Um, I'm not familiar with the decision. Obviously, um, we, would, uh, we would discuss any decision like that with the Attorney General because they basically represent us in those cases. Um, but I'm not in a position to comment on it at this point in time. We will certainly comply with any kind of judicial ruling on anything, including that. Pardon me? Does it concern you that these shops would reopen under that ruling? I mean, obviously they were closed as part of your yeah. order. So is it frustrating or concerning to you that that could change sooner? I need, to, I need to talk to the Attorney General and find out what the, what the actual parameters of the ruling are. I wasn't – did this just happen? Okay. Under restrictions, though, I mean, it sounds like there would be opening restrictions for them. Don't know. Governor, I have a, Are, a data question for you. Uh, in your, in your uh, data dashboard, there's a racial, I know you're concerned about racial uh, issues in, in testing, in, not in testing, in positive cases. But when you compare the bar chart of that to deaths, it seems like there's a difference in. in positive cases versus deaths. Have you noticed that? And what could explain that? 
I'm not smart enough to speak to that question. I, know, I understand the question you're asking. Do either of you want to speak to it? Go ahead, Commissioner. Um, so related to the, I think you're asking about the race ethnicity data. The what? The race ethnicity data? Yes. Yes. It's a hard, uh, high term. yes. Um, so we are providing that data um, based on what we have right now, and what we see is we can cut that down um, and look at it related to hospitalization cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, just like we do the other data. Um, one of the issues related to that data is there's still a lot of unknowns and missings, and it was the reason why we put in the order requiring that data to be put in place. As we learn more and gain more information, we'll be able to better assess what that means, although we have no doubt that, as everywhere else, we are seeing inequities in the way that COVID-19 is impacting our communities. And, and it is one of the reasons why we're having an advisory group um, talk with us about health inequities related to COVID and some actions we can take. So the um, I have to go back and look at all this data again um, in terms of how the lens you're looking at it at. As you know, um, 60 percent, almost, it's uh, 60 percent of our deaths are from long-term care facilities. So I want to like look at the look at the death against the ethnicity, the pie charts you're looking at, uh, to be able to explain it a little bit better. So there may be a difference there. Have Secretary, about the PSA, um, is that also being done in other languages? Yes. Yes. And also the contact tracers. Are Do you want to say which languages, languages it's being well? done in? So that would probably be helpful. So I wanted to show it in Spanish to all of you today. Um, we had them both up. So we have it initially in English and Spanish, and we're going to be rolling it out in the other major languages of Haitian Creole, um, Portuguese, Chinese. Chinese, and Vietnamese. And, and the contact tracers, they speak multiple languages? Oh, yes. Yep. They, um, the, the primary languages, and then they have the ability to, it's like 26 languages, I believe is the number. Yeah. So we have you have to get to the microphone, yeah. and I'm going to like, and I'm going to. So uh, our, our staff of over a thousand represents uh, 20 different unique languages, but we also are using the same language line that the uh, Commonwealth Health Connector uses uh, for all of their clients as well. So that represents 250 plus languages. I don't have that off the top of my head, no, sorry. Can contact tracing be more effective? I think Sherman hit on this a little bit, but if we have more people, so like the sales calls, will it be more effective, just the volume of calls? Or what, is there the, a the number one factor at the moment is people to answer their, their phone. We're, we're making um, close to 10,000 calls per day. Um, so if, uh, if people answer those, uh, we hope we'll be making fewer calls because we'll have to call you back fewer times. Governor, Governor the national... Yeah, they are. Governor, a federal judge had um, mandated testing uh, of ICE detainees and staff at the Bristol County House of Correction. Um, given that and given the um, high number of uh, MTC prisoners who tested positive after multiple testing was done, um, can you speak to what additional testing um, rollout there is for uh, jails and prisons in Massachusetts? and? Yeah, we're working our way through the prison system. In the end, we're going to test everybody. Governor, a number of lawmakers sent you a letter. They say they want the National Guard to set up uh, testing facilities in uh, disadvantaged communities where there are more pre-existing conditions uh, and you know, nursing homes in those communities as well. Is that something that you would expand the National Guard's mission to, to uh, include? I think part of the reason we created the relationship with 20-some-odd community health centers because they are, in many cases, the most trusted source for health care and for health information in most of those communities. Uh, a big part of why we chose to partner with them was we believed they'd be a better door, um, front door for people um, than the National Guard. They can deal with all the language issues that people have. They can deal with all the cultural issues people have. They're familiar to the folks in those communities, and we thought, in many respects, they would be a better answer um, than the Guard. But, they and, but we do use the Guard for a lot of testing purposes at this point in time, and if we believe we need more, one of the best parts about the Guard is they come when you call. 
but they couldn't take on an entire facility or an entire uh, housing project as this letter is asking them to do. I haven't seen the letter, so I can't speak to the specifics of it, but I'll certainly take a look at it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. We're fine on the federal loan. That's not going to be a problem. Um, I think the number's north of 700,000. Might, might even be up to 8, 800,000 at this point. Um, there are several issues associated with the processing. The biggest one, as we've said before, is just getting all the information right on the form. Um, and my public service announcement on that one would be the number one reason that a traditional unemployment assurance unemployment assistance claim doesn't process the first time is because the name of the employer that's listed on the form is not the same as the name of the employer in the system. That is the number one reason. And, and, and I, I can't emphasize this enough because we do get a lot of mail and a lot of incoming and constituent services about this and we run all this stuff down when it comes in and the number one reason most of the time that somebody hasn't gotten their benefits yet is because they don't have the right name of the employer on their application. It's the number one issue. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, it's a big part of why we've done dozens and dozens and dozens of town halls that hundreds of thousands of people have tuned in on. Um, our goal is to get everybody we possibly can get who qualifies uh, onto the system. And it's one of the reasons why we work so hard to be one of a very small number of states that actually got a pandemic unemployment assistance program up and operating uh, within a couple of weeks. Thanks. Can I ask, can I ask Lieutenant Governor?